to start off, do you guys just mind introducing yourselves, telling us a bit about your education, your background, and your interests as well? I guess I'll go first. Um, hi, my name is Lena. I am a um, PGY1 general surgery resident. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I did my undergrad at Michigan State University. I took about four or so years off um, to kind of work and, you know, make enough money to apply to medical school because that's not cheap at all. Um, and then I also use that time to get some more clinical experience as well. Um, and then four years after college graduation, <clears throat> I started medical school. Um, fun little fact, uh, while I was interviewing for medical school, I found out that I was pregnant. Um, and so I have a daughter, she's now five years old and her name is Evelyn. And um, a little bit unique about my situation with medical school is I did the whole uh, medical school experience as a single parent. Thankfully, I have a lot of family around the area that was able to help me out. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that, but it is achievable. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions about what it's like to be a parent in school or in residency, I'd be more than happy to help. Yeah. Hi, I can go next. Um, I'm Dr. Evan Tamura. Um, and I am a family medicine physician, uh, re recently relocated to Columbus, Ohio. I work at an FQHC here. Um, and my background, I um, grew up in Northern California and I came out to New York for undergraduate. I went to Barnard College in New York City. And then for medical school, I went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, I took a year off in between med school and undergrad and did some research with the um, Psychiatric Institute. I was a neuroscience major. And then I went to Einstein um, and I graduated. I went to residency back in California. So I was at Harbor UCLA, which is a county hospital in Los Angeles. Um, and they have a really strong social justice um, curriculum and uh, kind of mindset. And so I, I learned a lot there. Um, and then I worked at an FQHC in East LA, and then now I'm in Columbus. Um, and during my residency, I actually started um, a nonprofit that does uh, like street medicine outreach um, with refugee patients at the US-Mexico border in Tijuana. And so I'm still actively serving on the board of directors for that nonprofit, which continues to provide medical care. And we have a clinic down there in Tijuana. So happy to answer questions about that experience as well. Uh, I'm Wendy Chen. I am currently a hand and microsurgery fellow at the at UCLA. Um, I was born in California and moved to Taiwan when I was eight, came back for high school, UCLA undergrad. Um, and then because my science GPA was so terrible, I didn't get into medical school for two or three cycles. So what I did was I did the Georgetown special master's program. I worked at the NIH for a year, ended up going to Cincinnati for medical school. Uh, from there, I went to Pittsburgh for a plastic surgery residency. Um, I did a year of research in whole eye transplantation in the basic science lab. And uh, now I'm here doing this. <laughs> and I'm moving next month to go to UT Houston to be faculty there and doing pediatric hand. Um, I have a passion for diversity. So um, I started an Instagram called Times Up PRS, PRS for Plastic Reconstructive Surgery, and have been doing a lot of research about um, discrimination by gender or race in plastic surgery training, as well as any assault, uh, sexual assault and things like that. Um, so yeah, happy to talk to you guys. Thank you for those introductions. It seems like you guys have all done so much in your respective fields. Um, kind of the same format as the panel before. If you have any questions, please, you can unmute yourself or you can send it in the chat or you can privately message me if you want me to voice a question for you guys. So just opening it up to the floor if anyone has any questions at all. If not, I also have a few questions to ask you all as well. 
So I guess an easy one to just start off the bat. How did you guys get interested in your respective fields and how did you get to where you are in your career today? Um, I can uh, start off if that's okay. Um, so I, I went to medical school um, kind of having had some clinical experience volunteering at federally qualified health centers and specifically a maternity clinic and kind of working with a lot of immigrant patients and people who didn't have insurance or only had insurance because they were pregnant. Um, and so that kind of instilled in me a passion for primary care and, um, you know, working with people who have trouble accessing the healthcare system, whether because of, you know, lack of insurance or underinsurance or stigma. Um, and so I kind of went into medical school thinking I wanted to do primary care. I have a lot of passion for women's health. So I was really thinking about ob as well. Um, and I basically loved every rotation that I did, which is something you commonly hear amongst people who go into family medicine. Um, but I also kind of had the knowledge from the get-go that, you know, I really wanted to be a doctor in the clinic, in the outpatient setting, focusing on people um, and primary care. And I wanted to specifically bring that up too, because I know, especially kind of listening to the end of the, um, the, uh, panel previously, you know, there was some talk about make sure you're happy in your work, uh, which I totally agree with. Um, but I also want to emphasize that the medical education system that we have really focuses a lot on inpatient and specialist care. And that's just kind of the nature of how we learn medicine in this country. But the real reality is that the majority of physicians who graduate are going to wind up spending the majority of their time in outpatient clinics, whether it's a specialty clinic or primary care. Um, so it's kind of a disservice to trainees that we don't spend more time in clinics. Um, and the majority of family medicine and internal medicine grads are actually going to be outpatient primary care physicians, because that's really what our healthcare system needs. Um, and so, you know, that's an important thing to consider. I think another issue is that when you're in residency and medical school, you don't really get that continuity of care experience. I remember feeling like clinic days were like really stressful and not fun as a trainee. And so it's okay to have that experience. Um, just know that it is different when you're out in the world. Um, clinic is still overwhelming and stressful some days, but it's also really rewarding. And I feel like in training, you don't get the rewarding aspects of that um, kind of practice setting. So just kind of a caveat and a plug for primary care. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like I was drawn to primary care because of my personal mission and the reason I went into medicine to begin with. I felt like that's what was needed in you know, this country and my community. Um, and I felt like they need really good doctors in primary care. Um, going into family medicine, um, I got a lot of kind of feedback of like, oh, you're too good for family medicine, or, you know, you really should do something else. And I think that's something that trainees hear often. Um, I feel like outside of the medical education and training world, there isn't that same sentiment that family medicine is the easy way out, um, because it's really hard <laughs> to do primary care full time. So um, yeah, just a caveat about that stuff and a little bit of a plug. Yeah, I it is so important. <laughs> it is. And I commend you for doing it because I tried really hard and it just, it just was not for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I also did not have like the strongest science GPA when I was applying to medical school as well. So the year before I started, um, I also did a post back program and that happened to be the year that I was um, having my daughter. So um, it kind of was like a nice way for me to get my feet wet in medical school. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but I went to Michigan State College of Human Medicine for medical school. Um, and I came in thinking that I also wanted to do primary care. And I knew I kind of like um, took a liking to procedures. So I thought, you know, ob is a really good field because you get both that primary care aspect, plus you have procedures involved as well. 
And I really was like fascinated with women's health and passionate about women's health. Um, and my first rotation, third year in medical school was surgery. And I was like, wow, I really like this like more than I thought. And I was trying to like tell myself like, to convince myself not to like surgery. <laughs> I re really tried very hard not to like surgery because, you know, with me being a single parent, um, I knew that like residency going through a surgical residency was going to be very hard and it's gonna um, not allow me as much time to spend with my daughter. Um, so I continued doing my clinical rotations throughout third and fourth year. And I just realized, you know, like nothing got me as excited about um, waking up and going to work aside from like the days that I get to be in the OR or um, yeah, the days that I get to talk to um, surgical patients about their procedures and follow up and stuff like that. Um, so as much as I tried to like anything else more than surgery, I just could not. So that's kind of how I found my way there. And I just realized that I really liked abdominal surgery. Um, people were like, you know, you could, you know, do internal medicine, go into cardiology and you can do procedures in cardiology, yada, yada. And I was like, you know, I just realized if I can't like physically hold organs, I'm just like, not, <laughs> I'm just not as excited about it. Um, so that's kind of how I found my way to surgery. It wasn't easy. I had a lot of people telling me because of the fact that one, I'm a woman and two, even more so because I'm a single parent that um, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, even at my home-based institution, my the program director there absolutely loved me during my rotation on surgical oncology with him. And he's not an easy man to please, but as soon as he found out that I was a single parent. It was like his whole attitude shifted. Um, so you definitely still get that mentality from people that, you know, you won't be able to do this, you won't be able to do that. And I think you just really have to know yourself well enough to know whether or not that is something that is achievable for you um, and not to let people who, you know, aren't there to help you through the process to falter, or influence your, um, in opinion about yourself in any way. Yeah, I think it's uh, hard to be brave, but I feel like when you meet the challenge, uh, it. I feel like inevitably we end up doing it. And what's the worst thing that could happen is like, you're a PGY one, two, three, whatever, and you're like, oh, I can't do this. And then you choose something else, but at least you tried, or like you can do it, you know, there's no, reason why you shouldn't pursue your plan A um, all the time. Um, and there's no good time in surgery to have a baby and actually people who have them earlier, <laughs> it's actually better. Um, I'll be honest, I'm thinking about becoming a single mother by choice at age 37 right now. And I'm worried because as an attending, you have less uh, protection from having time off. Um, uh, and so, you know, I may have more resources coming up, but uh, it's not gonna be easy either. So there's no, there's no good time. The, but if anybody is wondering, I've asked dozens and dozens of women and men and parents and families and single parents, and I know other single mothers by choice and in the surgery life, there's no good time. So you should just do it and then figure it out. And, you know, people will work with you or, or you'll find a way, you know, it's not easy, but, um, you shouldn't have to give up a very important part of your life to, service this other, you know, community, this, this surgery community. Um, so uh, I, <laughs> again, I'm Wendy, I'm going to be a pediatric hand surgeon in uh, Houston. And um, when I first got interested in medicine is when I was living in Taiwan. And when I was going to high school in Taiwan, I volunteered at an orphanage for children who are abandoned for congenital uh, anomalies, whether it be dwarfism or cerebral palsy or things like that. Um, and that was sort of like a saving face thing uh, in an Asian community. And so I thought to myself, oh, was it? And, and some of them had just like clefts, like cleft palates, cleft lips. And I thought, oh, that was the difference between, between them having a family to grow up with versus not is something that maybe could be medically treated. And so then I gravitated towards that sort of treatment of children. And then at UCLA, I minored in public health and I worked in the community in that regard. Um, and then I got, when I got to medical school, I was not really necessarily thinking surgery because I thought in, in my head plastic surgery was all these things that you see in the media. I didn't understand. 
But I think one decision that people make early on is surgery or not surgery. Step one, if you, if you think that you got the bug or you feel like you can't just sit somewhere and do secretarial work and not have procedures, like that is step one, if, to be honest with yourself. And then once you think you want to do procedures and uh, then you start looking at what you might wanna do. So then I thought I wanted to be a pediatric general surgeon. And so my female mentor uh, sent me onto the plastic surgery rotation so that I could learn how to sew very well so I could impress the general surgeons later on. But then in one week, I did breast surgery, I did brain surgery, I did little skin bit surgeries, I did cleft palate surgery, and then it was all over. Like, <laughs> at one point, we were cutting apart this child's face and head so that we could move her eyes closer together and change the shape of her skull so that her brain um, would develop normally. And the attending, because he knew that he was about to steal me from general surgery, and he said, why would you want to do an appendicitis all day long? And I'm like, that's not fair. You don't do this every day, <laughs> but that, but it was true. So, um, so then that's how I ended up making very last minute change to plastic surgery. I will say that in a lot of surgery subspecialties, you meet a lot of people with a lot of psychologic or psychiatric um, challenges and like, uh, you know, having difficulty going through like denial or acceptance or all these other things with how their body is changing and not not able to do what they wanted to do or had been doing. And so for a brief moment, I also had been interested in child psychiatry. Um, but so I think all of those like sort of meanderings have kind of led me to what I'm going to be doing now, which is general plastics, peds, and um, peds hand, and then some adult trauma and reconstruction as well. Um, so I think being drawn to sort of a creative artistic side um, as plastic surgeons, like you work on principles and knowing your anatomy and not necessarily just doing a million gallbladders um, because every problem is different. And uh, like, you know, having a breast reconstruction, every breast reconstruction is different because the patient is different. Doing a limb salvage, every limb salvage is different. Every time a person blows up their hands with fireworks, it's a firework injury to the hand, but they're always different. Uh, and so you operate on having the skills that you just use in different scenarios and principles. And that's what I like that there is a sort of creative artistic side. Thank you for sharing that. And I know a few of you guys mentioned like obstacles you've had to overcome um, based on being a woman in medicine. And do you guys have any advice or strategies to help people become more resilient going into medicine? As, as a future woman physician myself, I'd be interested in hearing if you're willing to share about those obstacles or if you've encountered any obstacles due to your ethnicity as well, if that's been an issue you've encountered. I mean, I think um, the other panelists kind of brought up some things which are similarly alluding to the same thing, but don't, you know, you're going to face a lot of um, kind of restrictions or barriers from the outside world, regardless of whether you're a woman or Asian or not. But it's really important to not put, try not to put too many barriers on yourself. Um, like it was said, it's never a good time to have kids, but a lot of us are gonna have them at some point um, or you know, may want that in your life. And so don't put your own barriers on top of what other people are telling you. Um, and I think that's something that as women, we're particularly good at doing is, is telling, you know, putting ourselves, telling ourselves based on these perceived um, kind of restrictions that we shouldn't do something now or we can't do it right now, or you know, maybe we're not worthy of, of this particular path. And so it's really important to surround yourself with people who can really support you and talk you up and kind of be your cheerleaders and remind you like, hey, that's you telling yourself you can't do that. That's not anybody else. Um, and I think it's, it's just important to remind yourself that, that um, you know, you can do things, you should choose your plan A and you should stick to it um, if that's what you really feel is right for you. And if you wind up changing your path and it winds up not being the right thing, that's okay too. Um, everyone has kind of their own path and it doesn't need to be the same as what's perceived as like the successful or the right way to do things. So um, that's just kind of general, I think. I think it's also, I'm, 
of, at least for me, helpful to find somebody who kind of like resembles you um, as a mentor, like either whether that be a woman or a person of color, um, and just to, you know, make sure it's somebody who is like going to be in your corner. Like if they're telling you, you know, I don't know if, you know, you'll be able to do this or that. Um, if they have like any like reservations or they don't believe in you in terms of like what you want to pursue for your goals, then it's like, it's just by like <laughs> onto the next person because you don't have room or time for somebody like that in your life. And you want to have everybody who you surround yourself with like in your corner cheering for you and not people who are just going to like feed you seeds of doubt. Um, and I think, yeah, you also have to kind of, you know, stick up for yourself too. Um, if somebody is going to challenge you and say like, I'm not sure if you can do this, then you got to have enough confidence and faith in yourself that you're not going to let them, you know, change your mind. I would say that um, it's important to have the insight that um, you may not be your best ally. You can gaslight yourself just because somebody is gender or race congruent to you. They can also gaslight you or not be your best ally, um, whether on purpose or not. That's for yourself to yourself and for other people to you. And so um, I think it's important to sort of it's it's almost like therapy where like in the media or whatever it is you have some source of reality checks where like this is not right if this happens to me that's not right or if somebody says this to me that's not right I don't have to just laugh awkwardly and like be okay with it um and like you may not be in a position to say anything about it yet until you're a chief resident or or whatever it is but at least in your mind know that something is or is not right um, and you can do that by following, I really love this new account that just popped up on Instagram called Speak Up Ortho, um, because uh, it created a forum for a lot of women to tell their stories in orthopedic surgery, so that if one of those things, you see one of the things, you go, like, that happened to me. Okay, so that's that's not right. Like, I shouldn't just accept that. <laughs> like, I, I shouldn't just put my head down and, you know, um, just like these reality checks. And then I think virtually now in this last year it has exploded a lot of easy ways to just stay connected with people. So I also helped to found a group called Women of Color PRS, W-O-C-P-R-S, and it's on Instagram. And so we have like a uh, monthly or every two months, like a, a social hour or something and attendings come, residents, fellows, medicals. It ended up being a lot of medical students actually. And so this last year we actually um, had informal mentorships and sessions to help medical students like try to get into plastic surgery residency, which is really competitive. So um, similar to what other people have said, but I think most importantly, knowing your standard and knowing what's right, what's wrong, even if you can't say anything about it yet, um, just know that, it, you know, and then find somebody to talk to. Uh, there's lots of people, I think, uh, people don't realize that it's okay to cold call people. I think people are intimidated to do so, but you can cold call people. And the worst they can do is not reply or say no. And then like, that's fine. And then you just move on. You just move on. There will be somebody who can help you. They don't have to be race or gender congruent, um, even though that may sometimes feel like the safest or most likely to be successful. But I think increasingly um, people are willing to speak out or are becoming activated. What I call like, they may be sympathetic, but not doing any action. So you can like activate them to come up to the next level where they are aware and they do speak out and they do things to sponsor women or women of color um, and just continuing conversation in ways that um, you feel comfortable generating conversation, you know. I just wanna go off of um, what Dr. Chen said too. Um, like for me, my mentor was a white male, but he like did everything that he could possibly do bending over backwards to help me get to where I was. So yeah, it doesn't have to be somebody who looks just like you or represents you. But I think the most important thing is that it's somebody who is for you. Um, yeah. And different mentors can do different purposes. So mm -hmm. for that person, because of his status and his demographic, he may be able to do certain things better. But right. then you may have some mentors that maybe, maybe there's another mentor who was a single mom in general surgery, and she can do something else for, you know, 
her. And so you have you can have different people helping you in different ways so that you can holistically do it, you know? Yes. Exactly. Oh, I will also say that I've noticed, um, at least with like my classmates and peers, that people will be like, oh, I reached out to this mentor. I sent them an email two months ago, but I didn't hear anything back. And they're just like very passive about mentorship um, and finding that. And you really have to kind of be more aggressive with it because I mean as you imagine attendings are super busy and it's not like they intentionally want to ignore you at least I feel like most of them don't but they get how many emails a day and they might not have seen it so you really do have to like be a little bit more aggressive with pursuing I mean don't like send them an email every single day but you know if you have a mentor that you find and you're like oh I really like this person and you're waiting for them to reach out to you for the next meeting that most likely is not going to happen. You need to be the one to like check in and keep up because they have a million other things to do and you, no offense, are not their top priority. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would echo that. Um, I do a lot of work with students and trainees at different levels in the healthcare field um, through the nonprofit that I work with, the Refugee Health Alliance. And I frequently tell people like, you know what, can you just email me back in like a week or two when things are calmed down and I'll respond and, you know, don't feel bad doing that. Um, and especially if you're the kind of person who will actually show up and be proactive and create a project for yourself or identify a need based on like what you're seeing and kind of present that as a potential area where you think you might be able to participate, like that's amazing because that cuts my work in half. Um, and you may be wrong. And I may be like, you know what, I don't think that would be helpful right now, but you know, that tells me you're willing to help. And I may have this other thing that we could really use some help with. So um, yeah, I think be proactive, be thoughtful. You have a lot of experience and intelligence and expertise at and, you know, at different things in life, and you can always bring something to the table. And usually mentors are really looking for, you know, someone who's going to be proactive and who has a little bit of an idea of what they want to do and just needs a little bit of guidance about how to apply that energy. They don't want to have to kind of pull that energy out of you. Um, so, you know, if you can show them that you really are there to learn and do work, I think that's, the best, the way to get the most out of a mentorship. And you can have multiple mentors as was stated. Doesn't have to be just one. It shouldn't be just one. Thank you for sharing that advice about mentors. I've found myself to sometimes be a bit more passive than I should be in hearing that. It's really igniting the fire for me and probably some other people to try to go out and find those mentors to help you and help us in our journey. And a question did come in through the chat for Dr. Fambangza, but also every anyone can chime in. Um, it stated, I too had my child first year of medical school. He's three years old. I'm applying for residency this cycle and was told you need to apply broadly to match well. How do you navigate potentially moving to a different state and not having family to help support you? How do you get a feel for resident programs who are family friendly? Any thoughts? Yeah, um, so I too did apply broadly for one, my step score wasn't the most fabulous, but two, because of, um, yeah, trying to increase my um, chances of making sure that I do match. Fortunately, I do have a very, strong support system here with me um, in Michigan. So I did apply to like mostly Michigan programs and then um, in some other places that I uh, would like to end up. Um, my family at, to some extent was willing to move with me depending on where I ended up for residency if it wasn't going to be in Michigan. So I was very fortunate with that too. Um, I don't know if you have um, a partner or anybody else who like, you know, like family in different states um, in possible areas where you might apply or things like that, but that's something good to keep in mind as well. In terms of like figuring out which residency programs are family friendly, I think a good way to 
assess that is to ask how many residents have children and ask, you know, are these female residents versus are these male residents who have children? Because that is a big difference. It's easy for, you know, a guy to be like, oh yeah, I have like four children, but his wife is a stay at home mom. Um, we don't have that luxury as women, just because most times we do function as like, you know, that support system at home as well as um, work. Um, and then I would also talk to the residents who do have children and kind of ask them like, you know, what kind of support do you get from your program? Or, you know, like, what do you wish you could have at your program that would help you be, you know, more successful as a resident parent? Um, things like that. Um, and then, um, at least here in the Midwest, I know like Midwest people like to keep Midwest people or programs. Um, tend to consider Midwest applicants a little bit more seriously for some reason. Um, so applying like geographically in your area um, is a good way to kind of be like, you know, I'm very serious about these programs here for XYZ. And then also, you know, a big thing for me is I have, you know, closer family support um, and that can help them kind of get an idea of like how serious you are about being at their program. I don't know if that answered those questions well enough for you, but. I think one thing to be aware of is what your rights are. So example, from a Title IX standpoint, I've heard of women who like were put on a very difficult rotation postpartum. They got two weeks off only, and then they were written up or potentially their candidacy to continue residency threatened because they had to take 20 minutes to go and breast pump. And like, uh, that's just not right. <laughs> so know what um, the law is. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is if you're worried about asking and then maybe a program not ranking you as highly, then you probably don't want to go there anyway. Um, and it's better to find out sooner. Um, when you have fewer choices, I know that's a little harder. So kind of just temper that like, uh, you know, on the spectrum of how you want to manage that fact. But I think it's okay to be authentic because um, you don't want to end up miserable somewhere for, I mean, like three years is not so bad, but like if it's seven years, then, you know, that's like sometimes longer than a lot of relationships, so. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful to hear the perspective from you guys who went through surgical residencies, um, because I do feel like that's a particularly, you know, there are less female surgeons. Um, uh, in family medicine, there's generally more females. Um, there, it's not uncommon to see people get getting pregnant during residency, but definitely in some programs, there's more or less. Um, so like they said, you know, looking how many people, how many residents in the program got pregnant or had kids during their residency or how many have families, um, you know, that existed before the residency, um, you know, asking those, looking at that and taking note, I think that tells a lot about a program if um, they tend to have a lot of residents who leave and get pregnant. Um, you want to ask also maybe about like what happens to the workload of the other residents when somebody gets pregnant, because if they don't have an answer for that, that's probably a red flag that they never deal with that. And also then it's maybe less projecting the image of like, I'm planning on getting pregnant once I come to your residency program. Um, if that's something you're concerned about projecting, you know, you can ask, hey, if somebody gets pregnant, what's the, how does the workload change for the other residents? Because inherently, you know, if somebody's not there and you're a residency program of, of six or 12 or whatever, there's going to be a little added burden to the rest of the group. Um, so it's a completely valid question to ask. Um, I think it's also, since we're talking about a women's panel, it's also to, to take, it's also okay to ask, you know, why aren't there more female faculty? Um, or what are you guys doing to try to get more female residents or get more female faculty? Um, in your program. Um, I was fortunate and I went to, uh, at Harbor UCLA, the, um, there's a lot of female surgeons and like the director of the program is female and they're still just as badass and scary and make me not want to be a surgeon. But, you know, that was a really important thing about the program that historically it tends to have a lot of female surgeons graduate. Um, 
So, you know, that's an okay question to ask and an okay thing to take note of. Um, you know, what are they actively trying to do to diversify their faculty? And that goes for other things as well, not just male or female, um, but yeah. So I would recommend there's a podcast called The Wiser Podcast out of Emory that's like just female surgeons talking about stuff. And there's increasingly more, um, depending on the subspecialty, people will talk about um, these issues as well. So in the plastic surgery world, there's both private sort of individual led um, podcasts as well as the society has had podcasts talking about these things now. Um, you should know that what the board's policies are for your leave time. Uh, and then uh, one thing that I always say is like, forget that it's called pregnancy. Like what if somebody, so somebody in my residency had like needed an X lap for something. And so he was out for like three months. That was totally unexpected. And somehow everybody made it work and like nobody was bitter about it, right? Or like if you need to leave the operating room to pump for like 15, 20 minutes, um, like if you had diarrhea, you know, like nobody would be like, no, you need to stay. And if you like leave, then don't come back to my OR again. Like, but somehow when you're pumping your breast, it's like different. Like, and these are all doctors, you know? So why, why, <laughs> why can that they understand like, you know, we're coming, women are coming. Like there's a study out of Michigan saying that women surgeons based on the severity of the patients and the experience of the surgeon, the outcomes are better when the, when the doctors are women. And like, there's all these other studies. Um, some of them are escaping my mind right now because I have a lot, I've got a lot, a lot percolating trying to respond to this, but um, we're coming. And so times have to adapt, you know. <laughs> Okay, and just for our last question, um, Karen messaged in asking, how do you reconcile your work um, life balance with career opportunities? So I think that's really hard and I don't know that anybody has that figured out, but I think one of my favorite analogies that has helped me um, prioritize and be kinder to myself um, is the concept of like juggling balls and um, some of the balls are going to be glass balls some of the glass some of the balls are going to be rubber balls you're going to drop balls okay just accept it like you just can't it's not it, you cannot so um if you're going to drop balls then obviously you want to some like then prefer that they be rubber balls right so maybe not like your sister's wedding or <laughs> like um those would be glass balls or like if your child has something very important that would be a glass ball right but rubber balls would be like you know i don't know a research meeting or i don't know right like so adding two more patients onto clinic so you you're gonna drop balls and just know that and just try to prioritize and it is super okay to say no like when you know when people say when you say yes to say something you're saying no to something else like your most valuable 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 thing is time and time is something that is non-refundable you can never get it back once it passes it is gone and so to remember that that no matter how much you like medicine or surgery like no matter if you became the society national president board whatever like when you have a 13 year old slam that door in your face one day and you flash back all these choices that you've made in life, what's gonna be the one that's worth it? You know, is your, is the chair of such and such gonna be there at dinner when like things are not good at home? Like, no, I think that, or like if you didn't do the things that you wanna do in life, like at your, on your deathbed, like none of those people are gonna be there. It doesn't matter that you did like 10 more super rare, most amazing surgeries, you know? Um, so I think keeping a perspective as to what's important to you in life, because I find that there's some surgeons in the older generation where their entire identity has completely been pathologically wrapped up in their identity as a surgeon. And once they lose that, they like don't even know what to do with themselves. They don't know what to do with themselves when they go home. Like they don't have anything to talk to with their wives or you know, their kids or whatever. And like, that's not how I would define my happiness. So everybody defines happiness in different ways. If you don't know how you define your happiness, it's a really great exercise to, to understand both the little everyday things and the bigger big picture things of what really matters. Um, I can say like as time gets on and you're in your late 30s, early 40s, time passes differently. And, and um, you know, some things start getting more urgent. <laughs> and some things maybe in retrospect, you're like, I'm glad I did spend that time that way or I wish I had done something differently. So. 
Um, yeah, and going off of that too, I think we also need to do a better job of like reminding ourselves to give ourselves grace. Um, I'm sure most of us being in medicine, like there's a million things that we want to achieve and we realistically, because time is finite, can't achieve all those things. Um, I know at least for me personally, I would kind of beat myself up about like, I can't, you know, like not being able to stay in the anatomy lab an extra two hours because I have to go pick up my daughter from daycare, um, things like that. And being like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to get as high of a score as like other people in my class because I don't have the same time constrictions as they do. Um, and just like reminding yourself that it's okay not to be 100% all the time or be, I mean, I don't know how your guys' parents were growing up, but um, stereotypically Asian parents, you know, asking, you, you got a 95%, why don't you get 100? Um, and that like reflecting on yourself and like that has become your standard for yourself. I have to like remind myself to like quiet my mom's voice in my head sometimes um, and be a little bit kinder to yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, yeah, just, I think one thing that's really helped me throughout the years is, saying no more often than saying yes. Um, like if people ask me to do things, I will always say, I will get back to you on that and not saying yes right in the moment because in the moment I tend to want to do things, but I got to like reality check with myself. Like, let me wait on this decision to make sure that I actually have time to do these things. Um, so like my default for myself when people are asking me of extra responsibilities and whatnot is no. And then I can always go back and say, yes, I can do this versus vice versa. And then adding all that extra pressure on yourself. Yeah, um, agree. There's no good answer <laughs> uh, and it changes. I will say that once you are no longer in training, um, your time is a little bit more of your own. Um, so it's, it's really hard in residency to find that balance and the techniques you use in residency and medical school to have a work-life balance may be really different from the techniques that you use later on in your career. And that also may change as your career changes or your life changes. Um, so, you know, just kind of being adaptable. But I think the important thing is being self-reflective uh, about you know, is this something I enjoy doing? What am I getting out of this? Um, because that's important. Um, and sometimes we do get into the mindset of just doing things for the sake of doing them or because this is what other people are doing or this is what you think you need to do. Um, and really reflecting on, is this bringing me joy? Is this making me happy? Um, and if not, do I need to be doing it? Um, because yeah, your time is limited. You only have so much mental space and emotional capacity and you should spend it doing the things that fill you up um, as opposed to you know draining you. Um, so yeah, that's what I just try to do and kind of be self-reflective about is do I, you know, am I dreading doing this thing? Um, I think also just creating well, later, it's a really different mindset, but when you're applying for jobs, you do have a lot more of a say, um, you know, making sure that you're, you're, you're choosing um, a job or a workplace where it seems like they are respective of your time um, and your life and the facts and your, you know, your co-employees also have lives outside of work, um, if that's something that's important to you. Um, so kind of look around you at the community that you're trying to join and make sure it's one that you want to be a part of. Um, yeah, that would kind of be my suggestions. And on the dangerous end, like uh, one of the projects that I wanted to do was to do like two or three times a year have, you know, because I'm in surgery, have surgery residents fill out burnout, PTSD, anxiety, and um, suicide screening surveys because, you um, I don't know anybody that personally has committed or attempted suicide, but I do know like one degree removed. Um, so my friends have had people who, uh, whether as a senior level attending, a junior level attending, residents that have completed suicide. And so um, if you look up the data on physician suicide, it is very bad. It is, it's like soldier level, like suicide rate. So um, that's very important to keep in mind. Um, so 
you know, we're talking about just day to day balance, but on the on the clinical and dangerous end, like it's very important to be mindful that you're not teetering even closer, uh, and to know that depression and anxiety and PTSD often occurs in residents, um, sometimes on the short term, you know, um, but it, it would not be uncommon to have that and experience that, and to know that going in so that you can just manage yourself or like have people around or like just be mindful that it could happen or will happen. Um, just looking ahead to protect yourself. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, I think asking about what support when you're interviewing for residencies, like asking about what support there is, there are for residents, um, especially in terms of mental health, you know, are there residents, you know, is there a program where residents can get counseling or is that included in the health insurance? Um, I definitely interviewed at programs where I asked that questions and they were like, our residents don't, don't get depressed. And I was like, okay, yeah. Um, and that was a program that I didn't rank <laughs> because you know, if they're not even, if they don't even know the answer to that question, how are they gonna support you if you know something does come up? Um, so I think uh, being mindful of creating a putting yourself in a position where you have resources and knowing that depression is going to hit you at some point, whether it be subclinical or severe. And so you need to be able to, you know, have a plan in place for, for coping with that and having a support system. Thank you all so much for sharing these wise words and helping us plan for the future so well. Um, I think we're probably going to wrap up our panel. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your amazing stories. If you're willing, we'd love to get your email in the chat if people have questions or would like to reach out. Um, so just thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, guys.